So here's what I think we'll do. The renovation is imminent. It will require me to take my little studio apart. And I thought I would try to keep recording through that process, but the more I think about it, the less feasible that seems to be. So I had a brainwave, all right. I thought what we can do with this time is we can revisit some past episodes, some classics. We've been around long enough now that there are classic episodes of the JHP, and there are some from way back in the day that you may not have listened to or might not have listened to for a long time. And the more I think about this, the more it makes a lot of sense because we're working up to the 150th episode. So why not do a little retrospective, you know what I mean? So, in lieu of being able to record new episodes easily, I thought we would do what I'm calling Renovation Replay, okay? So I'm just going to present over the next, I don't know, three, four weeks, some of my favorite episodes from way, way back, back in the conversation days, that I think were profound and poignant and fun and really instructive and inspiring and informative. And I'm going to put new introductions on them, okay? Because what stops me listening to those old episodes is how bad I was at introductions. And that's because I had not developed an idiom yet, you know? I just hadn't gone through the evolution of developing my particular podcast style and voice. And so... I listen back and it's like, egad. But as I've said before, I leave those episodes up because they are the evidence of how much better things get over time, you know, how much things improve. And I hear that listening to episode one of Renovation Replay, which is the episode, the conversation I had with Jason Tate. And it was just so exciting for me to do this. I mean, when I talk about Good things happen when you put yourself out there. I always think of the Jason Tate episode when I say that because he is one of the most influential drummers on my playing. He is one of my favorite drummers on planet Earth. He is best known for his work with the Weaker Thans and Bahamas and Broken Social Scene. And he is the reason in certain ways that I played drums the way I do. It was his influence and I've always really loved his playing. And I never had a chance really to talk to him until this podcast came along. And so I knew that Bahamas was coming to town and very last minute on very much a wing and a prayer, I threw an Instagram message out to him just to ask if he would be on the show. And I did not expect a response. All right. I did not expect a response. So imagine my surprise and my delight when I got a response back from Jason almost immediately in the affirmative saying, yeah, I've got some time, let's do an episode. And that was mind-blowing to me, because the podcast hadn't even been released yet. This wound up being episode number four. I had canned other interviews, but I had not released anything yet. So it's not like there was a track record. It's not like there were 100 episodes available, and this was a show that people knew about. And of course, he'd be happy to come on. This was a non-entity. And I was a (laughs) non-entity. I remain a non-entity, but now we have 149 episodes of the podcast. So I was amazed that Jason Tate agreed to talk with me. And so I sent that out there. And then a couple days later, found myself sitting down for an hour face to face in the same room with Jason Tate, someone who has been so influential on me. And it was such a treat to do that. One of those pinch me moments, man. And it was very affirmative very, very early on in the process of making this show to get an opportunity like that to sit down with somebody who has just been a really, really important presence in my musical life. And it was a great chat. You know, it was a great chat. And what I've learned in re-listening to it is that I've gotten better at sound. (laughs) Now that was a face-to-face conversation in a big open space, very, very difficult to control sound in an environment like that. But I have, over the course of 150 episodes, gotten a lot better at doing sound. And I've gotten better at interviewing as well. And everything is an evolution, all right? This is how it goes, kids. You begin, and then you get better. Do not compare 
your chapter one to somebody else's finished book, whatever that saying is. So I go back and I listen and I cringe a little bit at me, but it's gratifying to see that things have grown. And fundamentally, the content of this conversation is great. Jason Tate was very gracious, very open, told me a lot of really compelling stories about just life on the road. And this is a pre-pandemic world. <laughs> we know a lot has changed since then, but the fundamentals remain. It was fabulous to talk to Jason Tate. I hope to do so again someday, you know? And I guess this represents episode one of Renovation Replay. It's going to be an interesting few weeks of just looking back at where we've been, speculating, thinking forward to where we might be going. Before we get to the rebroadcast of this conversation, I will remind you that there is a Patreon page for this podcast. It is patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast, where for the low, low membership price of $5 a month, you can support the show. Think of it, as I always say, of tipping me a buck 25 for every episode that I do. If you are getting something from these episodes, if you are being inspired, educated, entertained, etc., please do consider supporting at patreon.com slash John Huff Podcast. And now, and now, step back with me to the year 2019 and this conversation with the great Jason Tate. It was fabulous. I really enjoy revisiting it and we'll replay it on the other side. Duh. Listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Say hello, Jason Tate. Hello. Hello. We're uh, way up high at London Music Hall, above the Rum Runners stage where I've played many shows. And this is a privilege for me because I didn't say this in the preamble, but you are absolutely one of the primary influences on me as a drummer oh wow and i've been following you for a long time and you are the reason why i started picking up mallets and started really? yeah and started using shakers and playing with the snares <laughs> off and so there are several artists in this city that probably owe you for the drum parts that are on their records <laughs> thanks well that's great this is your legacy man well i was just lifting it from other people so i'm glad <laughs> yeah, this is the this is how um this is how tradition happens. Yeah, the continuum of things passed down. Yeah, yeah. yeah, was that always the thing for you when you started out playing? Uh, no, I I started off in punk rock bands, so it was basically uh, if I wasn't hitting the drums as hard as I possibly could all the time, I was not not doing it correctly in well, my mind. That's a punk thing. And yeah, that was definitely a punk thing. And then after a while, you kind of you shift, and I started playing with John Sampson, and he had uh, ballads. And, and these really beautiful slow songs. Yeah. So there's no way I'm going to bash through those. You have to play to the song. Mm -hmm. So I sort of uh, started reaching for different voices around me, whether it be Brushes. Brushes was the first one. I was like, I was so excited after we did recorded History to the Defeated. I was like, this is the first song I've ever recorded at Brushes. Amazing. And, and that sort of opened that world up. And that's, it was always a very like a, a free creative environment with that band so right. i could just i'm gonna play with this chunk of metal on my snare drum or on my floor tom and everybody be like yep yeah, perfect great let's go really? count it in <laughs> john k was cool with all that yeah absolutely yeah that's, that's awesome. why a lot of that sort of stuff grew because they just let me do it how did you get in that band i, I wasn't intending to ask you that but we're yeah. on the topic do you remember uh, this a while ago yeah my first band red fisher had broken up after seven years this is quite a while and then I remember just talking with my girlfriend at the time, not knowing what I was going to do, if I was just going to just cook for the rest of my life. Or, you were a cook. Yeah, I cooked for six years in kitchens. This is why I see so much cooking on your Instagram profile. Yeah, yeah I really, I still really enjoy cooking, but I, I hated cooking in restaurants. I bet, yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. Uh, but there's a really 
you know, you don't know what you're going to do with your life. And then a week, literally a week after my band just dissolved after seven years, I got a call from John going, I have all these songs. Would you be interested in recording them with me? And I'm like, had, had and I already, I was familiar with his Slips and Tangles tape, his acoustic tape that he put out. Right. So I thought, oh, yeah, he's doing some really cool sort of, you know, folk stuff. Like, I'd really like to do that sort of stuff. And so I absolutely said, yeah, let, let's do it. So we got together like a couple of days later and started working on the songs together. And Well, he first of all, he dropped off the demos of, of Fallow. Yeah. And there's like, it was like pretty, <laughs> I was blown away by them. Like, it's amazing. Like the, the, the title song, Fallow, with the open tuning and this beautiful song. Right. It's like fuck yeah I'm on, I'm on board with this yeah then we got together and started playing as instantly we just it worked really well together and then we're like maybe we should get a bass player <laughs> so i recommended that we get john sutton who was playing with me at the time at, nice in red fisher so he came on board and you know uh, maybe a month of practicing we went in the studio and, and made that record during the historic 97 flood of Winnipeg. Right. <laughs> yeah, they were in the middle of a session and I was moving my mom's furniture out of her house and putting really? it in. I was harboring our my sister's pets in our house because we live downtown. They live further south where all the flooding was happening. So oh, wow. it was interesting. Like, okay, I'll come get your dogs and I got to get back to the studio because we're mixing this thing or we got to do some overdubs. That's a pretty neat time. Weaker than's lore. Yeah. In- interesting. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, Play with John K. Sampson, who, you know, when we talk about the pantheon of Canadian songwriters, that dude's in it. Oh, absolutely. He's, yeah. he's unbelievable. Yeah. And then you fast forward and now you're with Afi. Yeah, for sure. That, you're doing all right. And even before that, I was playing with Christine Fellows. Right. Before I was and the really broken social scene John. stuff. Yeah, so I like have a really good. For some reason, I've. You really got to work with some great lyricists and songwriters. That's pretty cool. Great. I'm rather jealous of all that. <laughs> Mind you, I've worked with some great ones too, so I, I can't complain. Um, but your story about how you actually wound up playing with Bahamas, I heard this on a different show, uh-huh. and it's wonderful. Can you just tell it to us right now? Yeah. I was. Uh, w- my wife and I went and saw Nico Case play at Massey Hall, and... Uh, at the end of the show I looked beside me and Afi was sitting beside me the entire show I didn't even notice and I'd just been listening to Pink Strat all week like quite a bit and it's really hard to bend my ear with new music and really? stuff like that I'm kind of like well I have this catalog of records from the 60s I have to work on first before I get to contemporary music sure. but every once in a while something contemporary lands in your lap because of mutual friends and I really enjoyed this recording so we started chatting, and I'm like, what are you doing? Are you still playing with Greg? Greg Nelson was a friend of mine who played on it, and he's from Winnipeg. He's like, yeah, a little bit. I was like, well, if you ever need some drums, let me know, because I'd weaker than so I'd just finished a long bout of touring, so I had some time, and I always try to keep moving. And so he called me like that next week, and then we started jamming. It's just like... It was it was hilarious. This is a total like you know, like fresh love affair. He, yeah, we he is like all right. I found a drummer in Toronto who has a practice space in his basement. He's <laughs> like he struck gold. Yeah. So he came over and I was like, all right, I know all the songs. It's like we immediately just played all new songs, right. the entire jam. And then the next jam was like, all right, I know the. And he came over and it's like we play entirely Tom Petty songs, and Steve Miller songs. That's so funny. We'd just be playing all the time. I'd be playing practicing in my basement. I hear a knock on like the window. That it's already insulated and just like then I get a text like I hear you playing let me in <laughs> he's just walking <laughs> by and then we end up playing for a couple hours so and he's just on the way up at this point he's got one record yeah and yeah he's just he had his one record done and then so we immediately started demoing uh bar chords in my basement wow so recording stuff and then did did a lot of tours did a tour in a Subaru did a tour nice. in a a vintage suburban <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah we did a lot of work and we recorded in bar chords and then yeah that's so great because it's been a crazy I, ride when i met you outside you were not playing road hockey beside a subaru no we're in a bus that's a nice bus and we had plans originally it's like man if we ever tour in a bus instead of a trailer we're just gonna have like a 
a, a bowler type trailer that has a kitchen and we're just going to cook our own meals every day. Wouldn't that be fun? It's like, no, they didn't. We are bringing lights instead. <laughs> oh, that's really <laughs> it's great. It's great to be on the bus. That's, yeah, it's, it's such a great story. I, I love this synchronicity. Yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't sure of the sort of timeline between Weaker Than's ending and Bahamas starting. Did you know Weaker Than's were done at that oh, point? Oh, no, there was a huge overlap. We played shows together. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah Bahamas opened for the Weaker Than's. I wasn't playing drums with them at the time. Jesse Baird was. Okay. And uh, and even when I was playing drums with Afi, uh, Bahamas opened for Weaker Than's at Queen Elizabeth Theater. Okay. So there was a lot of like helping each other out. And that was kind of commonplace with me because I've always been juggling quite a few different projects at any really? given time. That quite often I'd be on tour with the Weaker Thans and doing double duty with the opening band. Oh, interesting. Who would be friends? It would be Christine or Greg McPherson. Right. So, yeah, it was pretty common at that time. That yeah, I get to I play a lot of music every night. So, Weaker Thans, I mean, did you plan to end after that album cycle reunion tour? No. It, no. was, it just kind of happened. It's not even over. We haven't even, okay. we haven't even, this is something that we've even talked about ourselves. It's a, it's just a, you get to a certain point and you just go, we need a break. Right. Like in any relationship. And it's very hard to go through counseling sometimes, <laughs> which is the, the situation. It's like, we have a lot of longstanding uh, things with each other. Sure. That are not like terrible. They're not terrible. It's just like after that amount of time, you really, it's healthy to take a break or work through them. So we kind of uh, took that break and then I got lucky enough to get to still work with John on yeah. the last Winter Wheat record. Yeah, yeah, so which is a great record. Yeah, I'm glad that we, we're still working together because it's oh, yeah. like he's, I really, I really see him as a, a good friend and great. some, uh, like someone who I can just call up for their opinion on, on anything that I find sort of challenging in life because yeah. he's sort of like, the Zen, <laughs> he's got this the Zen outlook of life, where it's like, well, maybe you should not rush into this or whatever. And I didn't tend to just run around and just like run into walls. And right. He can talk me, talk me off, off the ledge sometimes. That's a good so. friend to have. Yeah, I it's think a great I, friend to have. I, I'm, hopefully, I'm that friend for some people. I'm not. I have to think about <laughs> that. But um, so there was not necessarily this period where weaker thans weren't playing, and you were like, I don't know what's going to happen now. Yeah. Well, it's just a, a, a slow uh, decline of interest in, in how we participate in the band. And uh, it's really hard to explain because we can't even explain it to ourselves. Yeah, sure. It's just slowly, we've always, ta always taken quite a long time in between records, like minimum right. of five years. That's true, actually. Which yeah. is like, you know, career suicide in the music industry yeah, can be like, can be we don't really the fact that we get to make a living any sort of living is uh we're pretty grateful for it it's not like yeah. we've ever achieved to we have to be on a top 10 radio we have to right. do, do all the stuff we have to uh we have a goal of uh, playing in stadiums that was never on the table of this band at all right it's um it's interesting though because you you built the kind of endurance that not a lot of bands get. So a lot of, a lot of yeah. bands will flash in the pan and have a, a couple of hit songs and then be gone. But yeah, I feel like the weaker dance could tour across this country next week and, yeah. and do really, really well. Well, yeah, we took the unfortunate route of being forged in the fire where, yeah. Of uh, my introduction to touring was rolling a van two and a half times before even playing a show. Really? Yeah. Uh, getting a to sleep in a bed was something you wrote home about luxury yeah you'd sleep you literally would i'd be sleeping on hardwood floors in parks really rough situations and not complaining about it because i was like wow i'm actually out on tour with a band seeing the world for free you need that kind of mindset i didn't care if i was starving i knew it's yeah. like somebody would give me a food eventually we walk into the fast food <laughs> restaurants and go we're I'm starving and we're on tour from Winnipeg we'd be in San Francisco and the employees were like fuck yeah you want some food we'll give you some food amazing <laughs> so like yeah. life will carry you through it as long as your intentions were you're pure, pure like ours so after going from that situation to 
oh, we get a hotel room. Right. So there's like five guys in one hotel room. It seemed like a lottery, <laughs> a sure. lottery winner. Sure. So it progresses. But if we were starting in the opposite where people expect like, I want that tour bus right away and I want to uh, have special treatments it's all these ways I'm like people walk in the room and it's like I want complete silence while I'm here don't look me in my eye right. that sort of fucking prima donna shit like I don't know that side of the world at all it's, it seems absurd to me so I think those people when the reality of when they can't get what they expect to get they will drop off pretty fast and I think that's a good thing <laughs> it's well yeah it, it's road life is intense yeah I mean I I haven't done a lot of touring but I've done enough to know that it's a weird, intense experience. And especially if you're at that level where you're van touring or Subaru touring. Yeah. And sleeping who knows where and eating who knows when. Yeah. That that separates the people who are in it and the people who are not in it. And it's, yeah, it's really hard because I'm generally, I'm an introverted person. And when I'm at home, like my wife is constantly telling me, he's like, just go out with friends already stop staying at home and she's completely right but i'm like dying of ex exposure being in the world because i'm i can't think of another situation like maybe the military or a sport a sports team wouldn't be the same where you're constantly around the same people you're in the van with them from your waking hour driving to the show you get to the city you will probably go to the band room together you'll go sound check together you might disperse for some sort of food and then you'll come back and you play the show and then you'll be drinking beer in the band room together and then you'll be in the hotel together yeah. for months on end. Yeah. And then you're in public. So you go, I need a break. And you just go to a public park and you're constantly around people. It's, it's really draining. Oh, and when yeah. I came back, our last run for Bahamas was six months away from home. Oh, wow. So I went through a thing where I would and like drop the kids off at daycare and drop my wife off at work. And I'd just drive out to a forest and, and start a fire really, and just sit there and hang out with deer all day. Just I like deer, deer more than people generally. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, they're cool. They just chill. Look at yeah, you. They're just like, what's that guy doing over there eating ramen noodles? Six months is a long run. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. Of, it's like, I mean, you don't, it just, it, 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 it grows and grows. It's not like you start off and you go, we have six months. Yeah. You're we fine. okay? <laughs> no, I'm just, just making sure everything's running. Okay, good. That's We're good. good. <laughs> We're 50 minutes in. I forgot to hit record. That's a nightmare scenario for me. <laughs> that happens. We're good. We're good. Sorry about that. How do you work that out with your wife? You got a kid at home? How it's, you... it's, it's incredibly difficult for my wife. That she's, was, a, that she's was, a musician as she's well. A musician too. She's working two part time jobs. She's taking care of our kids. It's like, it's ridiculous that she has to like bear that burden while I'm away. It's, it's when I get back, it's, and then I come back and I'm, I'm completely burnt out and, and she's frustrated with me. It was like, mm. you should be doing absolutely everything and I should. And it's like, she gets mad at me for going out to the forest for the afternoon to try to recalibrate. You know, because you walk be trying back, to take care of things, but you walk back into a different world than you left, right? Like in yeah. six months, they get kind of used to you not being there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's well, I'm yeah, yeah, definitely with my wife. My kids are a little less they're like, all right. <laughs> the guy we get to play hockey with is back. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the fun guy's back. Yeah. That's funny. That's a thing for me because I, um, the longest I've ever gone out is six weeks and I don't have any kids. So that's all right. That, that pressure isn't there. But, um, usually I, if I'm gone, it's for three or four weeks and I'm back and I feel a certain amount of guilt <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> being gone, having fun for those three or four weeks, you know, yeah. uh, though there's hard stuff that comes with it. It's not certainly glamorous at my level and particularly it's not, but, um, it's a, it's a thing for me. It's like, how do I, how do I rationalize this with the family that I'm gone this much? Yeah. It's hard. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that Julie is a professional musician as well. And has done, she's probably been to more countries than I have touring. Yeah. yeah. She has been to more countries than I have touring. And uh, so she, under, she understands the, the fun and the, the, the boredom of it. Sure. 
And she's okay with you going. But it's hard. It's like we'd be on an opening run, opening for Jack Johnson, and the catering is just like fucking bananas. And we'd be in Maine, and I'm texting her going, they just caught lobsters this morning. And they're like <laughs> handing me like a, a craft beer menu to select a beer from. And I forget that she writes back like, you are an asshole. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Didn't need to know yeah, that. Sorry, I thought you would appreciate it for some reason. <laughs> That's a fine line. Yeah. yeah. That's a fine line. But but it's tough. That's gotta be that's gotta be nice to step up to va- to uh tour bus level and Well to, yeah, it's nice to get a glimpse into that world and but you know it, but the rally is it's such an up and down with its industry, especially if you're like a freelance drummer, you yeah. you go from one situation to another very quickly. Like I came home and after six months of touring and immediately after two days started rehearsing with Christine Fellows for right. like a handful of shows. And so you went from playing, you know, to like whatever opening for somebody for 10,000 people to playing in somebody's house. And that's just as awesome. I like oh, it yeah. more, oh, but yeah. that's the reality of working musicians. Yeah. It's not this uh, modern drummer sort of, I'm at this level. And I, I mean, certain certain people are, but most drummers. It's like uh, 10 guys. It fluctuates what you do all the time. Yeah, there's like a handful yeah, of guys. There's a few of them, and, yeah. and they're a modern drummer every month. But even the guys at the high level are like, they're putting out online lesson packs, and they're, you know, teaching, and they're doing whatever. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's important to be diverse, you know? Yeah. So what do you yeah. do when you're not on the road? What do you do back home? Oh, uh, well, once I recalibrate and get an interest in music again, I well, I'm I compose. Mm-hmm. So right now, my wife and I are working on a a project with the, the Winnipeg Arch- Architecture Foundation, where cool. we're they want to design an, an architecture tour a phone app on the number ten bus route. So you'll get on the bus, you'll turn on the app, the music will start. It's going to be scored by me. Cool. So I've been writing music for this, and as the bus moves through the city, you, you get a narration of the buildings that you're passing, the points of it, different points of interest. Interesting. So we get really interesting projects like that have come up, or that's what's on the plate right now. Uh, before I, I did some work with uh, contemporary dancers from Winnipeg, with John Sampson, and did a solo one with Joanna Riley. Cool. Uh, Riley. Which is a really, I've never played solo in my life, so I was super freaked out. What instrument were you playing? I was playing everything. Really? (laughs) If you looked at my setup, I was like completely overcompensating. I I didn't play a drum set, but I had drums that are droning. Okay. And then I played guitar and and, and all sorts of different things. Uh, I, I did make a solo record, too. The drum solo, yeah, the drum solo yeah, record, yeah, yeah. which is a feedback record. So small little projects like that. That's an that interesting project, though. Yeah, it was like it came about with my having a, a conversation with my friend Steve Bates, who's an old uh, bandmate. Steve and his uh, partner Jake Moore were in a band together in the early '90s called Bell Makina, which mm-hmm. was sort of a really repetitive droney type band, all instrumental. And their world is definitely audio art. Okay. And uh, just, they, they kept, like, John and, and Steve and Jake and Christine have always encouraged me. They're like, when, is, when are you going to write a record? When really? are you going to do a record? And I, so I've been trying to write stuff for years and years. And, and like, how am I going to write and sing a song uh, and give something to the world that hasn't been brought out again? That's a so, lot of pressure, man. Don't put so much pressure yeah, on yourself. Well, it's, but it's there. It's like, okay, well, I play with some of the best songwriters in the country. Like, am I really going to try to write lyrics? <laughs> no, I'm going to avoid it. So I know I'm not going to play a game that I'm going to lose. So I just I had to <laughs> wait until I came up with an idea that was uh, I haven't heard of before. Okay. And that was my own approach to something. So I discussed it with Steve over dinner and we talked about, uh, I just said, well, I was thinking about maybe doing a, like an amplified drum feedback record. And, he, and th- I, that was all I said. And he said, that sounds awesome. I'll put that on with my label. That's amazing. So I said, okay. And then my wife being like the organizer of everything in our world said, well, we should apply for a grant. Like write down your ideas of what you want to do with this. 
so I started experimenting with with drums feeding back because that, that was my first experience when I first started playing clubs I'd ask for kick drum in the monitor and it would come through too loud and yep. it would just go yep. and like well I, I actually like that sound what would happen if I tuned a bunch of different drums to different pitches and had them feed back and manipulate them through different ways through gates and trigger through a drum machine but have the only source of what you're hearing just solely be drums and purposely avoid any sort of skill that I've acquired through 30 years of drumming. <laughs> just sidestep all that skill and just wow. approach the instrument from a new way. And then I thought, okay, conceptually, I can get on board with this because I can't think of anybody else who's trying to do this. So, And I've also, also, I'm a big fan of, of drone and, and uh, ambient music okay. as well. So, yeah. Uh, so I made this record and I've fallen asleep to it hundreds of times. So it's, it's working. <laughs> you put this one on vinyl too, right? Yeah, we made, we had 20 hand lathed, uh, 25 actually, but 20 available for the public to buy. And, uh, yeah, they sold. That's <laughs> and, great. And there'll be no more. Uh, you, really? you can download it on, on Bandcamp. Yeah, so, but there. those yeah. physical copies are. Collectors. They're items. done. We're not going to make any more. Wow. Ever. So I like the fact that it's it'll be this neat little archive that some people who are ahead of the curve will have. <laughs> Did you feel some sense of wanting to own something? This is a thing for me. Yeah. Since, since I'm not a band member technically anymore, I'm a side player. I don't own anything. And I, I feel a lot like I want to own something again. It's partly why I'm doing this show. Right. Yeah. Something that's your own. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I definitely had that feeling when I was part of Weaker Than's. Everybody yeah. had their own input. Right. And I felt like everybody contributed a significant thing to that band. But yeah, there's something very gratifying and, you know, quite frightening to release as your own. Yeah. And a few years ago, if I would have looked at the project that I released, I would have just been like, oh my God, this is just so, this is way too weird. There's no way I could do this. Really? And like, no one will like it. And I'd be concerned about what other people thought about it. But I, I'm actually very, very proud of what I did. It's cool. I have listened to yeah, it. It's, it's a weird record where it's very, you know, it's obviously polarizing to a lot of people. Like mm -hmm. either they'll see the merit in it, or they'll just go. Or they. When, have, when does the song start? Or they have no soul. Like my, <laughs> my mom would listen to it as intentionally because the drums are all low end information being recorded. That's just the nature of what they sound like. Sure. It d does not translate to phones, iPads, or computer speakers. Right. Which is another thing that was really attractive to me because I don't like listening to music on your phone through the speakers. Are you a vinyl guy? I'm a, I'm a, I'm like a high fidelity. I like to listen to music through. I like, I have a lot of records. Okay. I, have, I have a lot of CDs. I didn't get, did not get rid of my CDs. All right. And I have I listen to my phone, but when I listen to things on my phone, it's going through a fucking real stereo like system. Like a stereo system, where right. Where I can see, hear the full fidelity to, from yeah. top to bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so many people are catering mixes to those things, which are fine, but it's 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 kind of gross. After a while, it's... Uh, my wife would, when she worked for Vinyl Cafe, would do a lot of work just giving, looking for music on her laptop and if I was in the same room after a while, you know, it just, it drive me nuts. Really? It was kind of started to sound like listening to somebody just crinkle tinfoil in a room all right. day. Yeah. Because you're just getting high in and yeah. it's, and it's You're an audiophile. Out. Yeah. So but I you, like the fact that the, my mom would go to check out my record on Bandcamp on her iPad and she's like, there's something wrong with my iPad. All <laughs> I hear is this little, mm, mm, mm. That's and the then tune. nothing else. And I go, that's the that's my record, mom. <laughs> I said, mom, you have to go get speakers, and then, or I go get headphones or something. And then she gets the headphones, and then she's like, probably just as disappointed when she hears the actual that's thing. So funny. She's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> that's awesome. I love it, man. It's so different. That's great. And I'm glad you've got that outlet. That's cool. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to get away from the music you play every night. Well, yeah, it's always good to try to have a creative outlet for sure absolutely absolutely no. for me it's um i'm not much of a songwriter a little bit but i'm a writer so my creative side is that 
so I blog and I do tour blogs when we go out and that kind of stuff. Nice. And it's, again, it's an ownership thing. It's like, this is mine. Yeah. Podcast too. It's, I just think it's important. I'm learning about the sideman thing. It's relatively new to me still. So I'm trying to figure out this world, you know? I know. It's, it, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be a sideman. Like you're in, you're out, you're, you yeah. know, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. You're there to, yeah, facilitate whatever needs to be done yeah. in that situation. Yeah. And sometimes it goes against your instincts, which is generally ends up being a good thing. You mm-hmm. know, it, you can grow from that. And sometimes, you know, do, too much of one thing is not, not good. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so you it's have true. to keep working at things. I'm. It's lucky, you like, even the Bahamas, we do so many shows, but we... On this last big run, we just had a, a practice room set up as well, so we can play. We sometimes play for an hour before we even hit the stage. Really? Yeah. So that's like a lot of. It takes a lot of what is bad out of touring sure. out of the air. Sure. So you're actually working on stuff, and when we're out there, we're not working on our set. No. We're playing like Doobie Brothers songs. <laughs> really? Yeah, we're just having fun. We're right. just trying to figure out other people's songs and jamming and then just just joking around. That's good for so we're playing connection. music and we're laughing at the same time. That's and having so good. Fun. And if you're not laughing and you're playing music and you don't get any joy from it, that's a really fucking dark place to be. Seriously. So it's good to have that 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 was a great idea to have this this practice room. It's it's important to have that chemistry with people you play with, especially if yeah. you're in such an intense situation for six months. Yeah, absolutely. You, you yeah. need that rapport. So if you kind of keep things fresh, it's almost like the, the the equivalent of like a hockey practice. Right. You know, you have your your set moves and stuff like that, but there's also a lot of play involved in that, and and through that you gain intuition with yeah. the lines that you're playing on. Sure. And you know, if you drop it, you know, seventy five percent of the times it's gonna hit hit somebody's tape, you know, with just a blind pass. Right. And yeah, because they're gonna be, be there. on stage with the, that same sort of mindset. Someone slows down a little bit, you know they got your back, you know where it's going. It's just like it's uh, really empathetic ears on stage. Do you play these shows to a click? No, I've rarely played to a click. Usually if I play to a click it means I'm recording by myself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> interesting that's cool yeah or sometimes it's usually a studio thing where right. it's if something becomes problematic i'll just go well I'll just leave me the song i'll play it to a click and then come back and play to it that's cool but usually it's me because i will even last like working on this app i got to a section where i wanted drums so i put down drums and i put down bass and it was to a click and I go, oh no, I have to redo the drums. This sounds so bad. Really? And then I just referenced it to the click. And then I looked at the bass and looked at the sound waves of the bass. And like, no, actually, I'm just a really shitty bass player. <laughs> <laughs> so I, my appreciation for bass, bass players, you know, just grew a whole much more. Yeah, it's nice when you play with a good one. Yeah. But the click is like, yeah, I, I still think it's a. Uh, uh, I, I I don't like metronomically perfect anything. Uh, I don't I don't like things that are harmonically in tune. Really, I prefer the opposite. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's way more interesting to me. Like I'm trying to think of whether weaker than's had things. With that band, it was indie, and so oh, it yeah. had that vibe, and so that you could have stuff that was slightly out of tune or whatever. Yeah, I remember. One of my favorite bands from that era was the Archers of Love. Do you know the Archers of Love? Oh, yeah. I'm from yeah. Other, some of that stuff, yeah. Their stuff, their guitars were out of tune on purpose. I swear to God, they were <laughs> on purpose. Like, just yeah. like clangy and like weird. Yeah. It was great. It was the energy, right? It was it was the vibe of that. The Bahamas stuff feels really super organic. So it's like, it feels like a click would stifle some of that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I yeah. mean, everybody in that band knows how to play drums everybody's a multi-instrumentalist in this band so everybody has this great feel and it's you could just i could just drop out like last night i went to do a james brown drop at the beginning of a a big crescendo yeah go down low but i didn't i dropped the beat and i stopped playing for about like four bars and i just went 
that's cool. That sounds fine without me right now. And then I eventually just fell back in with the Found band. Back like, in. Usually it's like, oh, I fucked up. But it's like, no, these guys have my back because they're so. Did anybody even notice? Small. Oh, yeah, they noticed. <laughs> and they're like looking at me like, that was really cool. <laughs> oh, nice. It's nice that you're not doing that with <laughs> fear. Like, yeah. Oh, man. When, yeah, when it's done with fear, it's, yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> oh, that's great. So um, I, I do follow you on Instagram and I, I love the, the drummer driver seat photos you have of stages all around the world really oh yeah there's like sydney opera house and red yeah. rocks and it's like yes those are the things like yeah i would never never have dreamt that i was going to play those venues yeah. in my life at all so when i'm there i'm it's not you take it's that not in. like i've earned this i've done this for so long yeah this is yeah i should be here right now i'm yeah. like fuck wow i get to play here and I'm, I really appreciate the moment. So That's I usually amazing. snap a pick. And I was like, when we we're at Red Rocks, I just kept thinking of like the YouTube record, the live right. record, and the entire, because my brother was so into them. And, and it, it was not lost on me at all. Like playing the Ryman is. There's, it, there's it was, a photo it of you. It was really amazing. There's one of you outside the Cavern Club, I recall. Yeah. I creeped yeah. you hard today in preparation for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been there, walked down there twice. Once when I was there with Broken Social Scene and once with Bahamas. That's so cool. Yeah, it's I like mean, I'm a huge Beatles fan and my son is a massive Beatles fan. So I went and bought them some shirts. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. I, I do this too. I'm super duper lucky that I've been able to tour in Europe twice in the past couple of years with a local artist called Sarah Smith. And, uh, you know, it's, it's club shows for the most part, a couple of smaller festivals, but it's just even being in some little town you've never heard of in Germany, you yeah. know, and just sort of looking out the van window going, I can't believe I'm sitting here right now. This is amazing. The, that's what I'm most excited about are the small towns now. Yeah. Like the non, uh, vacation destination towns right. where you would never pay out of your own pocket to go to some town and check it out. But it could be awesome. It's a, it's a great experience. Like we're playing North Bay tomorrow, and that's I'm most excited about going to play there because I've never played North, North Bay. Bay. It's like if I only brought my camping stuff, I could have run out into the that's woods right. after sound check and started the fire and made dinner <laughs> on the fire. <laughs> I'm, I'm into that stuff. Yeah, sure. it's great. It's great. So I'm I'm incredibly envious of the places you're playing, and it's fun to watch. It's yeah. really great. It's great for me uh, as a working player. Uh, to see somebody who's who's doing it, who it's and is working and having these successes, it's really inspiring. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it's great to have. I mean, that was the whole reason you, I signed up for it is the idea that I could probably see the world for free. Yeah, you've seen a lot of it. Right? <laughs> yeah, so it's great. I get to go home and my 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 sister and my niece just want a trip to uh, New Orleans. So. Oh. I was really excited that they're going there because it's such a great city. So I've never been. I'm glad to go. You got to go eat at this place. It's going to look like a dive bar, but it's really great. It's so <laughs> and great. so they'd go there. It's so awesome. Yeah, it's good to get little. See, it's it's funny to see the world change. You know, particularly Europe. Like first time I was there it was '97 or '98, right? When the Deutsche Mark was still there before the Euro. Sure. And it's, it's weird to see Europe slowly evolve into not the same town, but all the shopping areas all generally look the same. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no matter where you are. Yeah. If for me, it's still just super novel to drive by and see how old everything is. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, you're at the Dome in Cologne. That's you're not going to see that anywhere else in the world. Right. Yeah. That's bananas. And like coming from Winnipeg, where our old building is like turn of the century 1900s yeah like, this is a young that's country <laughs> yeah yeah and for me is a it's sort of what i look at is like music music it gives you such amazing opportunities even at my level it gives you such amazing opportunities you know yeah. and um for for people who are reluctant to try or whatever or, or, or to stick with it it's like there's so much good stuff there for you if you just have the courage you know yeah just to go for it yeah. and so i watch accounts like yours and i think yeah that guy's doing it man that's awesome <laughs> it's so great it's wonderful so we have to talk about a couple more things real quick okay. a I, I need your prediction for the jets 
uh, in the Stanley Cup run this year. Well, I guess we already clinched the playoff spot. Uh, what was the last thing that I read is that depending on uh, how Minnesota does, it might put us in the first round playoffs with Dallas Stars, which <laughs> could be a little troubling because yeah, the last be time a... we played them was not very good. Yeah, it could be okay. But when, when you, they go into the playoffs, like it, it's like a start over. Hmm. It's a start over. All your stats throughout the season – they don't mean a thing. They're a reference point, but everybody elevates their game and plays differently. And I was just so stoked on how well I did. And like this is coming from somebody who I literally stopped and quit hockey 30, 30 years ago. Yeah, I played double A hockey when I was a kid. Then I played high school. And I got really burnt out on it. And I was more interested in skateboarding and drumming. So I just stopped. We lost the Jets. I stopped watching professional hockey. Sure. Like in the, the 90s. And and hockey was you know it wasn't that good back then and and then I started watching again with my son and hockey is so it's super interesting now uh-huh, it is it is I think it's so much better than it was the it's so much faster at the first time I'm watching I was like what the fuck but why aren't they calling the two line pass right, and all right. my friends are laughing at me like oh, no dude they they stopped that because you know trap hockey is slowing down the game and it sucked and everybody hated it. And like no, there's like no holding anymore. Like all most penalties are being called, and no one's fucking boarding anybody. No one's really trying to hurt each other. Yeah. And players with great skill are, are are allowed to shine. I mean, that was certainly the case with Gretzky. Sure. You know, and McSorley yeah. on the ice together. Yeah. There was a dark period in the '90s where. Yeah, it's just like the stage fighting, and I was like, oh, okay, this is WWF shit, and it's fucking boring. Yeah. 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 And now it's like, and then it, it and it transfers into like people like Pavel Barber on on YouTube, his YouTube channel, and he's like looking at more technical aspects of hockey and, and stick handling and stuff like that, which is uh, like that sort of it's creeping its way into the NHL, like the Michigan Scoop, right? For sure. example, yeah, yeah, yeah. like Mike Legg doing that. That's exciting. It's like I could see the relationship between that and skateboarding in the 80s where everybody was so concerned with vert skating and how high you can go. Can you do uh, McTwist, all that shit? And then there was this other camp with like Rodney Mullen and Mark Gonzalez street skating and they're going on the, doing their own thing and anybody could do that thing, do street skating. And they're coming up with innovations that that were so groundbreaking it eventually started influencing the vert skaters sure. and i see that possibly hop- happening with hockey interesting like floor hockey is gonna and like zorro pretty soon people actually will start zoroing in, in the pros we'll see if that happens but i can just i i can see the the correlation the relationship between that so yeah. it's, it's exciting time to watch hockey interesting because i'm a habs fan and nice. these, these are Less interesting. Well, they're, I can't say they're not interesting because the, the team is really hard to figure out right now. Some nights good, some some nights not so good. And the, the Habs have been varying degrees of lousy more or less since 1993, right? It's, <laughs> it's by our standards, been an incredibly dark, dark couple of decades, you know. Uh, but, you know, they're just on the edge of the playoffs right now. I think they're in a wild card spot. So there's some hope they're going to have to play somebody good early if they get in and it, oh, it, yeah. it could be rough but yeah i've been following the habs but i really liked the habs when i was younger did you yeah oh yeah oh, definitely i knew you were i good. had a high school trip to the my teachers like i was in school i was like a skateboarder and a i was into drums and i was a bit of a stoner and my high school teachers found out that i played double a hockey mm-hmm. so they said we're starting a high school hockey team this year and you want to play and i'm like nah <laughs> and they said we're gonna it's a free trip to montreal and we're gonna go see the montreal canadians play one night and i said okay, okay. i will play <laughs> high school hockey <laughs> so we went and i went and i got to see the Habs play in the forum and Amazing. they just beat the shit out of the detroit red wings so bad that i talked to a few of my friends into just leaving the third period and we went to a bar had a beer <laughs> when we're like 17 years old of course they're in montreal they'll serve oh, yeah. us and we're just like we'll have no, no a beer what all. kind of beer do you want we don't know just bring us a beer i don't know beer and kind here you go kid beer flavor that's so great <laughs> and our coaches found out and i got benched for the first period yeah. the next game <laughs> you got you got your trip to montreal that's what yeah. matters man <laughs> had to seize my opportunity oh that's so great 
Yeah. Um, well, we're hoping for good things from the Habs, but it's they're an average team playing against some really good ones over in yeah. the East. So we'll see. Maybe my interest with hockey will expand uh, next year to the entire league. <laughs> Not just Winnipeg. Winnipeg. No, and I'm Nashville. just watching Winnipeg games. That's yeah, it. That's right. Yeah. And then seeing other teams how they do when they play Winnipeg. When they play but Winnipeg. Now, I actually even last night I turned on like the 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 Leafs game. I watched it for a while, waiting for like the Reddit Why? stream for. Don't watch. Don't watch. I the just Leafs. want to see what's up with them. Oh, no, no, no. It's, <laughs> it's not good for your <laughs> eyes. Oh, it's not good for your eyes. Your Habs fan. Oh, it's not good. Look, if they win the cup. I'm moving to Winnipeg to live with you for a year because <laughs> I'll drum tech for you, whatever, but I will not be able to stay in my province if Toronto wins it. When was the last time they won it? 60, what? Oh, it's seven? been three, 400 years. It's been uh, a long, long time. 67, I think. Yeah, that's a long time for a team with that much buying power. You would think, eh? What the fuck? Every game is sold out. They can buy whoever they want and then... Yeah. Uh, Why? Why? What, what does that tell you? I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Anyway. I don't know. I don't know. A lot of, a lot of more, like even my wife is way more, uh, can explain the mechanics of how teams are drafted and yeah. why certain players coupled together could be beneficial and how like, even how Paul Maurice is shuffling his lines around so much with the jets, how these, you know, sort of average players can just super shine. And yeah, she has, she has a better grasp on it than I do. Really? Yeah. Uh, my wife hates hockey the end <laughs> <laughs> well she did too she what? did too and so did i and then our son you know once your son develops an interest in something you're like we're on board that's we're different on board. that's different and then and luckily for me the uh the history of playing hockey so i'm able to go out to the rink with them and go sure. okay you want to learn how to do this we can try this and when the canadians were winning the cup in 93 i was dating my wife at the time so she's my girlfriend we're sitting on the couch in her parents' basement watching my team win the cup. She's falling, she fell asleep beside me. <laughs> Dude, like, she doesn't get it, you know? So that's, that's her level of interest in it. She likes it in, in person, though. That's more fun. Yeah, so absolutely. So I close every episode with three questions. Okay. And this is actually designed to be something of a motivational podcast. So I ask every guest what, he or she is working on right now personally in terms of personal development personal development yeah you doing anything for yourself these days i'm just trying to be more patient really yeah yeah tell me about that uh it's not going too well <laughs> but i i can recognize things and yeah i'm just trying to be a little bit more humble and, and mm -hmm. grateful of what i have and constantly think about the worst case scenarios when I think things are really bad really? and frustrating me, yeah, it's it's really hard to like I have a bad temper and I'll, I'll fly off the handle and it's really hard to step back for that just mm. for a second and think, oh, things could be so much worse for you right now. Just right. don't fucking worry about this right now. Interesting. What 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 instigated that sort of change of perspective? Uh, just I guess maturity just getting and older. having uh, you know a wife that's a, a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> Uh, point out these things and guide me through them. That's nice. You know? it, it's it takes a certain amount of maturity to be open to that. You know what I mean? To, yeah, to yeah. accept that. And from having somebody. children was like that's if that's not like a an exercise and patience. Yeah. I don't know what is. Right. It's yeah. Like, okay, I was actually joking. I was like, I'm gonna design a thing called the the daddy delay. Or the mommy delay, yeah. and it's just this a microphone that's a lapel microphone, and then a speaker that dangles around your neck, and you say one phrase once, and it repeats it ten times for you. <laughs> so you go, Sal, I want you to get your shoes on, and then it'll just automatically just repeat you ten times, so you don't have to keep saying it. Okay, I need you guys to get in the car. Okay, you guys need you to get in the car. Okay, you guys. <laughs> that's hilarious. Kids will do that. I yeah. I have cats, and they're enough for teaching patients. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a cat too. There you go. Oh, <laughs> he, well, he tests yeah. us. Too. I bet. Yeah, they have a they have a power to do that. What are you most excited about right now? Uh, I, I I think my my kids. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Family. Uh, living back in Winnipeg is exciting to me. When did you move back? We moved back six years ago. Yeah. From Toronto. Yeah. So yeah, I love the community that we're living in right now, and. Uh, I really enjoyed last winter, even though it was so cold really? and all 
we're outside quite a bit with my kids. And if your kids say, let's go outside, let's go skating, and it's minus 30 out, you go, fuck, that's awesome. Let's that's, do it. That's great, man. So I've been really enjoying being at home. Uh, there's always things that I kind of gravitate towards that spark interests that are sometimes short lived, but there's the long term ones that have been there, like obviously music and, and cooking. Mm -hmm. Cooking is something I really enjoy now that I'm not doing it for a living. Mm. And so I'll go out and eat around the world and try to bring back different different things. Oh, that that's I've, great. That's a great that's idea. And try to do them at home. So if, you know, there's no not hot Nashville hot chicken in Winnipeg, I don't really stress about it. I just make, just it, make it at home. <laughs> I really got into barbecuing. Uh, like, like, well, so Texas style barbecue. Mm -hmm. So offset smoker barbecue. Okay. But I like to do more Carolina style barbecuing. What's the difference? Uh, uh, Texas style is offset smoking. So they'll have a, a firebox, which is actively burning fire feeding uh, a convection uh, oven with the whatever you're cooking and it vents out. Uh, Carolina style is they have a burn box, a barrel. So they burn down the wood to coals then they shovel the coals into the, the uh, convection oven, the wherever, whatever's being smoked. Yeah. So it doesn't impart as much smoke, but it's, it's a uniquely different style. And they're usually, in Carolina's it's hog and... And uh, Texas primarily beef. Nice. But I've been doing like like uh, growing up punk rock. A lot of my friends are vegan, oh, vegetarian. Really? So I'm just like I I love cooking for them too. So I'm trying to do uh, vegan barbecue and stuff like that. Smoked so, tofurkey. No, I, I hate. <laughs> I don't like tofu. It's generally unless it's really well made. I I, I fucking hate it. <laughs> but I do think I like things like smoked coconut. Oh, interesting. And smoked uh, cauliflower. Oh, wow. Even smoking almonds. Like, I I've just buy a bunch of almonds and just smoke a huge batch of them and put them in mason jars. That's a great idea. That's a good smoke. Smoke everything. Like, I would make Brussels sprouts and sear them on in a pan, and then throw them into the chamber and let them smoke for a while. And there's and, and in Manitoba, it's primarily, well, there's maple and oak. That's the, the two. Yeah. And oak is a uh, magical wood that imparts a lot of vanilla flavors obviously through oh, like french oak barrels for wine and what that imparts into wine that kind of happens in in food too when you smoke it in the barbecue that's great so i mean i, I go and i do shit like that plus you get to play a fire for hours Fire's i fun. love playing with fire and it's warm you're in a cold cold part of the world yeah totally that's great cool my wife would love this part of the show she's a big food person uh, last question is, what message do you have for my listening audience, Jason Tate of Bahamas? Jeez, I don't know. I've this never is your chance to tell the world. Always keep your fire burning clean. If there's too much smoke, the barbecue will be ruined. <laughs> that it should be a thin blue smoke coming out of the smokestack, not white smoke. All right, so I'm going to point everybody to your Instagram if they need barbecue tips. Yeah, what is my Instagram? Oh, it's Jason J. Tate. Jason J. Tate. I'll I'll yeah. create show notes and I'll put all that stuff in there. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna, you got to go up and play in a couple hours. So yeah. I'm going to let you go, man. All but, right. But uh, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, thanks for asking me. My pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. My city is still breathing, but barely it's true. Through buildings gone missing like teeth. The sidewalks are watching me think about you. Sparkled with broken glass. <laughs>